Really exciting things of how to use data and BIM and all these kind of fun toys uh, to make the workplace a better place, right? All right, good. Uh, let me turn this over here. Guess I'll start. Uh, how do I do this? Uh, okay. So let's switch this. Uh, do you do? Hi, I'm Lebo. I'm Grant. Uh, we're both on the BIM team at WeWork. Um, I'm going to start this off, go through some sort of like, I guess, general big picture of why sort of our BIM context is a little bit different, why sort of you see us sort of use a little bit different tools, kind of approach things a little bit differently. And then uh, I'm going to hand over to Grant, who will sort of go through bunch of tools we built and then there's sort of a QA and a at the end where we can demo some stuff, have a dialogue. Um, yeah. Uh, so just kind of an overview. Um, we were founded in 2010 and uh, we're sort of now sitting at over 200,000 members with 230 buildings, 13.5 million square feet in 71 cities. Um, and as an outcome, as sort of like most of you know, we do a design build just because we have, we do as much as we, I guess, feasibly can in-house. And kind of in a traditional model, um, there would be several different companies that are involved throughout this entire process. Um, and usually as a BIM, sort of your visibility and sort of your scope is within that. But for good or bad, WeWork owns that entire scope with additional scope on the bottom. So as kind of someone who manages building information, we are uh, to a certain extent responsible to answer to all of those guys. Um, as part of what we deal with is the business sort of is the building, sort of is the data. And depending on who you talk to, in what situation, those things may or may not match. And part of our job is to find those little discrepancies and find solutions to do them, whether they're a technical solution or a process solution. Um, we use kind of a wide variety of tools to achieve that end. And kind of this is one of the main reasons I guess I came to WeWork is that as an architect, sort of, I was taught to do things in a really shitty way and it really sucked and wasted a lot of time. Um, but sort of as BIMs for WeWork, what we're able to do is sort of discover, have this culture of knowledge sharing and kind of have this compound uh, return on our time investment. Um, we work like to say that WeWork is a platform for creators to make a life, not just a living. For us, I think BIM at WeWork is a platform for explorers that make connections, not conveniences. Um, now I'm going to hand it over to Grant. Beautiful. Hi, everyone. So, hello, I'm Grant. Uh, I think just a big picture, we both come from architecture backgrounds, studied Architecture worked in firms for a few years, um, and a lot of the stuff you'll see here, um, you know, we've pretty much picked up in the past year. Um, there's a fair amount of like Python and some code that we leverage, all of which we've kind of leveraged what everyone else has has kind of done in the the span of humanity, and and you can kind of just build on that progress. And I think that's like an underlying tone of all of these tools is that. Um, we were able to leverage a bunch of things people figured out many years ago. Um, and that is something I think that would definitely empower sort of the architectural process um, in pretty much in pretty much every way. Um, so a lot of a lot of what we sort of build, kind of as Lebo mentioned, falls under these three categories. We're either kind of pulling data out, connecting two data points, or pushing data to someone. Um, and because of the sort of wide integration that WeWork is, you just you end up with a bunch of users, um, all with different use cases, where the architectural and, and sort of building industry might be broken up into maybe like five or six or eight use cases. Uh, we discover half a dozen in a day that we didn't really know about, um, and so it's kind of keeping up with this constant um, constant change of of what it means to have have a deliverable or produce something uh, meaningful. Um, so one of our first sort of explorations into this was a tool called PyRevit. Um, it allows you to essentially host 
uh, very quick, simple Python scripts in Revit and run them in Revit. Um, so we kind of borrowed that naming convention and, and started PyWeWork, which is just a, a tab that uses sort of that technology. Um, and this is just a series of tools, uh, kind of low level, uh, you know, everything from moving a tag to the center point of a room to updating a tag type based on the room type. Um, this one here just puts your point cloud on its own work set automatically. Um, let's see, what's another fun one? Uh, yeah, this one, so we, we care a lot about area and rooms, and you'll see a lot of that, uh, those sort of objects are leveraged in our, in our Revit tools. Um, and so this kind of takes our area uh, plans and pipes sort of the metrics that we get from that into uh, just like project information. So it's a lot of just pushing data in and out. Um, this one on the top left is one of my favorite because it's the most odd. We're essentially trying to uh, mimic InDesign with cropping images. Fun one. And then throughout, throughout these little tools, you'll see up here uh, just highlighted what is used. Um, I'll run through them as they appear. So we're obviously using Revit. Uh, Python is kind of the language that, that these tools are driven on. Um, and then RPW is a uh, Python wrapper that one of our colleagues uh, built that essentially just makes um, calling the Revit API super, super legible and convenient. Like literally like dot get walls will give you all the walls back. Um, and I think that type of mindset allowed Lebo and I to jump in really early um, in our sort of coding uh, journey uh, because it was just made sort of easy and accessible to us. I don't know if you want to speak briefly about this. This is a, a transit map. Um, in the project's life at WeWork, usually it'll start with a real estate deal. And the, the first sort of deliverable that the project team is asked to generate is a programming packet. Uh, when I first joined WeWork two years ago, this was my worst nightmare. Uh, it involved about three hours of InDesign work where I was you know, trying to grab the latest line types and icons and all that stuff uh, with some HTML and JavaScript. You can get it for any location uh, and with up-to-date Google data. So it actually is sort of a valuable deliverable instead of a, a sort of static map. Uh, Sonic, this was a, a quick tool. I don't know, is anyone here familiar with Airtable? Do you use it? No? So Airtable is essentially just online Excel uh, with a slightly sexier uh, user interface. Uh, but what this, this exploration was, was uh, just harvesting a Revit model and pushing up essentially the Revit data as records. So we kind of had two, two tabs. One was the room tab and the other was all the other elements, so walls and families. Um, and we were able to essentially um, display the Revit data in a more familiar way for people in finance, uh, people in uh, construction estimation. Um, so essentially creating a, a better scheduler, better data viewer um, on an existing tool. Airtable is something we use almost across the whole company in various ways. Um, you know, one logic sort of we inject in between, you sort of see here that when you harvest it, it'll give you a change log. And then also someone else connected to the same Airtable can pull that change data back into their model. So it's kind of a two-way communication tool instead of just a reporting tool. Right, where sort of the A360 functionality is, you know, syncing two models. I think we, you know, some some people at WeWork are literally just interested in what has changed, and they're not actually interested in the two data points. So if you if you sync the model, they they already are missing the thing they need. So this was kind of exposing exposing that process. Here you can see edits are actually made in the Airtable, so I'm just changing program types, um, and then I'm able to sort of download uh, those changes uh, reliably into the model. So you'll see it illuminated there. All right. uh, the plan viewer, uh, this was a, a two or three day, four day project. Um, Similar concept to the Airtable uh, Air effort, except this is just a web app. So we kind of packaged the similar uh, harvesting method of the model into a kind of nice clean UI. You see the floor plan, you see the room that you selected, uh, and you're sort of able to sell it or, or say that it is uh, you know, in negotiation. Um, another nice feature was just sort of room stats. So um, you know, instead of kind of embedding a 
a schedule on a Revit sheet and then printing it and giving that to someone, our data is constantly changing. And so it's needing a sort of live, up-to-date version of any room, any floor, any object at any time is actually a, a super real need. Um, so this is a fun one. I think Japan is was yeah. using this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so another interesting thing worth mentioning, you know, WeWork's this huge company, but we're also expanding and, and opening new business lines all the time. So we actually do get to work with, you know, groups of people that are, you know, three, it's a team that's three people strong and they're going to go to Japan and try to, you know, uh, build a bunch of WeWorks. And so it does feel like, um, you know, you get these intimate connections with smaller teams with smaller needs sort of all the time, despite the general growth trajectory, which I know is something I really appreciate for sure. Um, we can demo this later. Uh, this is just a quick a GIF, uh, but we made a sort of a, a more expansive web app that uh, displays uh, Revit floor plans. It's able to, you know, change the tag. Um, we can do some color visualization, some data viz on this. So this is kind of using our general layout plan color scheme. I can switch it to show, uh, you know, quantity of elements. Um, and yeah, it's a fun one. You can search rooms and stuff. We'll play with that later probably. Um, this was kind of one of our first explorations into using uh, Firebase, Google's sort of database cloud platform, uh, and Vue.js, which is a JavaScript library. Um, really the pattern that we kind of leveraged was, you know, storing data from Revit in an agnostic way. Uh, we're typically using JSON to do that. Um, and then using some some HTML JavaScript frameworks to just push that data to you know the user in a nice clean UI. So if this you know Revit room were to change, the user would sort of see that uh, change. I know this was uh, really helpful for our logistics teams. Um, you know they can hover over a room and immediately see what's in the room, um, as well as kind of see some uh, metadata around the around the room geometry. Personal favorite, how I'm been. Uh, this was um, kind of our first exploration into using the BIM mindset entirely outside of Revit. So one of the huge BIM uh, tasks at WeWork is just answering a boatload of questions on Slack. And we, in a standard week, hire about 30 people. So if our onboarding process is not perfect, the stress on the BIM team is it's almost my full-time job, like to literally answer the same question over and over again. So this was a um, half Slack integration, half web app that just centralizes questions and answers. Um, you can host files on the site as well. So I could say, you know, where's the latest room tag? Uh, and the answer could literally be the file. Um, so when someone asks that question in Slack, you know, where's the latest room tag? It'll respond with similar questions. Uh, they're able to, you know, select one, and if there is an answer, they'll get uh, directed to that resource. Um, it launched like two weeks ago. It was already like 550 asks, and I think about 150 questions. Uh, so it's yeah, it's catching steam. We can demo this later as well. Uh, Voyager, also using Firebase to to store data. This is essentially a, a bookmarking add-in for Chrome. Uh, and I guess a sort of side spin-off of Hotline BIM, basically centralizing online resources, just like a, a favorites manager might. Uh, the advantage of this, though, is that we can sort of uh, attach tags. Um, the author is, is sort of pinned to the resource, and it won't let you add duplicate resources. So, you know, if I was on a website about Firebase, learning about how to, how to use it, I might hit Voyager to tag it, see that Lebo's already used it, and message him about the resource. Um, we were just having a side conversation before this presentation, and uh, he's actually been using Voyager to kind of see what I've been looking at. Um, we're collaboratively coding on a project right now, and instead of you know slacking me and, and asking about my sort of thought process, he's able to literally follow my breadcrumbs and, and arrive to the same sort of conclusions, which is pretty awesome. Uh, I think. After those tools, we kind of started to see this larger picture where um, we could both, you know, sort of 
centralize certain data points like standards, uh, but then leverage familiar tools like Revit and kind of bridge the gap. So um, I'll just run through a couple of Revit add-ins. These are also written in Python in the in the Pi WeWork tool set, uh, but they're just a little more robust, so I thought I'd go through them. Uh, this one's called Auto Finish. It uh, will collect uh, wall sweeps in the model and offer the user the ability to essentially wrap the walls of any selected room in a finish wall. Um, the tool itself will avoid curtain walls. It'll avoid walls that are glass. It'll avoid you know things that um, wouldn't typically be wrapped in a in a sort of uh, finish wall type. And the underlying benefit of this, aside from just saving interior designers a bunch of time, is that we're able to sort of manage uh, different finish types outside of Revit. And the user is sort of blind to progress in that, but we can kind of bridge the gap and, and you know, the user trusts that they're using the latest standards and we can manage them in a sort of effective way. Um, Auto Room, uh, intimidating title for sure. This basically uh, addressed the fact that WeWork is a very modular, um, it's a modular build out. So we have, you know, specific program types, we have specific objects, about 60% of our floor is typically office. And so we kind of looked at that and said, okay, how can we intelligently put together these things in a way that maybe doesn't care about larger floor plate, but abides to these certain rules of these objects. Um, so auto room basically will accept any rectangle. It could be a, you know, walls or detail lines, doesn't really matter. It will consume that shape, and then depending on the object you feed it, it will sort of, uh, you know, fit out the room. So in this case, I fed it desks. It fit out a hot desk area. I ran the same tool and decided to create an office, so the algorithm kind of changed in terms of how it lays it out. It includes a door. I fed it phone booths. The phone booths were able to sort of array in the space, and then I fed it um, a custom L-shaped desk or maybe a conference room, I forget. I think I fed it a conference room. And it's able to kind of do the same math and, and uh, run, the, run the build out. What's exciting about this tool is that all of the sort of control is exposed to the user on the family side. So we're only using six family parameters here, width, length, uh, there's a length and width clearance value, and then there's a length and width offset value. And by changing those, you essentially change how the algorithm uh, distributes the objects. So this is an example of our uh, sort of enterprise team uh, making a custom L-shaped desk. Some client wanted, wanted to fit that out in the room. And then by changing uh, the value of the offset, you know, it, it will sort of push it out and array it in a more, more distributed way. Um, this allows the team to quickly report, hey, the space you're looking at can accommodate this amount of desks. If the client changes the desk type, we can get back an answer within seconds, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, similar only for offices, so a little bit more robust control over how this thing will subdivide offices. Um, where auto room kind of assumes you're making one room, auto offices assumes you're trying to make as many offices as you feasibly can. Um, so this will subdivide um, a space based on um, some, some just number values. Um, and this is maybe a little less design driven. It's how we put together offices is 100% predefined. So it's really just about unit mix at this point. So it allows the user to sort of care about the things that truly matter, not putting a slider in the exact place that it goes every single time. Um, this was a quick study to explore on the sort of Airtable stuff we were doing before. So instead of syncing data, this, this attempts to just rebuild the whole model. Um, so it will one by one sort of place all the elements. So I'm placing walls, I'm placing families. Um, if the family is not present in the model, it will hit our server and try to load it in. So it kind of takes this, this content management conversation a little bit farther. And then once it's placed geometry, it'll sort of place uh, rooms as well. Um, one thing that was kind of exciting about this but not really explored was just that because we are kind of flattening all the data, we can essentially harvest, you know, let's say a single Revit model has 10 links in it. 
if we harvest that model up, I can bring down all the objects into one model and they're all editable. And that's because I'm sort of placing them fresh in, in one model environment. Um, so it, we, we typically will have two Revit models. We'll have an existing conditions model and we'll have a layout model. Um, because the existing conditions model is linked in, you know, it's locked, all that. Um, there are certain cases where I need to, you know, share a model or share a condition, but I don't want to kind of have to deal with, you know, sending the person six Revit files just to show them this room that happens to have a column in it uh, from the other model. So because this is sort of downloading this data fresh, some of this data is from the other links, it can it can sort of instantiate the full model into one uh, environment. How long does it take? This download uh, for a floor, it takes about 30 seconds. Yeah. So it takes the link, downloads the content, imports it. So it's, it's, a, it's a live object into your main file? Uh, it, it's a two-step process. We're sort of harvesting up so that the, the Revit model gets sort of converted into just, you know, like an Excel sheet, just line items of data. And then on the download, you're sort of specifying what elements you'd like to bring in. Um, so if I just brought in rooms, you know, I'd get a boatload of errors that there's a bunch of rooms. Um, content viewer, this is sort of a current exploration of ours. We are just kind of playing with ways to define objects in general, uh, just outside of a family file. Um, so this is a quick demo. It's doing a lot in the background, but it's essentially taking a RFA file, uh, exporting it as an FBX, it opens a UI list version of Blender, exports or imports the FBX, exports the model as JSON, and then uh, hosts it on the web. And part of the reason we're kind of doing these acrobatics is that um, you know most of our users don't even know what Revit is, um, so we have to find ways to sort of expose them to BIM data without mentioning Revit or even sending them, uh, you know, the Revit installer. Um, and so this was kind of a, a recent uh, a win that we kind of uh, were able to pull off. So we're excited about this one for sure. I don't know if you want to bring it there. Okay. So yeah, four sort of main points um, at scale. Small integrations actually have a massive impact. Uh, and that's, I know, something Lieb and I very much appreciate about WeWork. Pretty much everything, every improvement you think of making, you know, has potential global impact tomorrow. Um, and that's been a really fun, a fun uh, sort of metric for our projects. Um, definitely the multidisciplinary nature of WeWork um, sort of allows BIM to have um, not only a stronger impact, but it kind of looks at itself, looks at itself in the mirror. I know when I joined, I was sort of uh, valued for knowing architecture at all because it represented such a small aspect of WeWork. Uh, but now the sort of ask has been to push BIM uh, logic and sort of mindset onto everyone that we interface with um, so that we're all kind of speaking the same language. Uh, kind of speaks to, to three. Um, and then in general, just a culture of sharing and building upon work. Um, I think we're doing this internally, but also just learning how to code a little bit and kind of getting more into this culture of, um, you know, collaborative tool building. The groundwork is already laid for us. I mean, it took very little time to build our first tool just because the framework was there. I mean, it was like four lines of code. Um, so that was definitely an, an underlying, underlying success of this for sure. So yeah, general question and answer. We'll happy to demo anything further. Um, yeah, that's what we got. Yeah. So when you're building these models for the US, for Japan, mm -hmm. and you have these predefined specifications in, do your tools have the specs for each particular region? So when somebody in Japan is using them, they're seeing the dimensions that are appropriate legal to Tokyo versus... Amazing Tokyo. question. Yeah, we're so we're sort of dealing with that now. Um, we recently you have... Uh, the question, so yeah, so, oh, good call. So the um, question was just about regionalization and the fact that sort of multiple versions of multiple standards have to be maintained at the same time. Um, this is a problem we're kind of just experiencing now as, as sort of regionalization becomes more real. 
Um, the quick answer is yes. The long answer is we're sort of revamping the tools to, to work that way. Um, a recent example is um, a project called Genome that um, basically allows a real estate deal to immediately be piped into a sort of programming calculator. Um, and part of that is obviously knowing where the building is coming from. And so it will um, you know, attach itself to the location and change standards based on, based on that. Um, another kind of thing we're going into now is, you know, when you start a Revit project, having regional templates that not only are sort of, you know, you change the unit, but you also have regional content that gets injected or regional uh, whatever settings that um, need to be applied to the model before, you know, the user starts. One more question. Yeah. So within that, this is all if you bought a property and you're allocating it for potential use, but with WeWorks looking at properties to buy, mm -hmm. are you presently or do you foresee using tools like this to say, okay, this looks like a good investment, but what can we actually do with the structure in right. Geneva, right. for example? And, uh, um, I, their regional requirements. Right. And, Right. I mean, that was actually, when I joined the company, that was one of the first sort of like things I was interested in just on my own and never got actually the chance to sort of hop into the real estate side of the business and, and catch it before it gets to me, so to speak. Um, I know there's been sort of smaller explorations. I don't know if you know of anything around that. Um, I mean, in terms of like test fitting, we actually go pretty far um, before we even sign anything on a building. Um, but I think a lot of the work of like genome is sort of uh, matching that prediction to the amount of human labor it takes to get to that point of certainty. So yeah. kind of like if we can get there through kind of some sort of algorithm without having someone to sit there for hours laying it out, then we can sort of meet them in the middle and sort yeah. of save a lot of time and let that person use that time for something way more productive. Yeah, I think we've kind of maintained a modular mindset when we build these things. So like with auto office, you know, it's not going to lay out the floor for you, but it's going to tell you if the floor is efficient in about 10 seconds, you know. So there's there's these small gains that I think when you kind of slam them all together, they, they sort of represent a process that might not be so uh, religiously defined and, and sort of followed, but it's sort of, you know, it's there. Uh, if, if you're curious enough, you can kind of find out about it. Your question? Well, it's sort of related okay. to... Yeah. What the potential Yeah, there's definitely a bunch. Oh yeah, uh, just the the sort of chemical makeup of a floor. How do we program, uh, you know, an empty empty floor, empty building? Um, there's a bunch of room to grow in that area for sure. I think that's something that we definitely have our sights on this year to improve. Um, you know, we've had smaller teams try to figure out the floor problem. So like, you know. All right, I'm going to define my circulation first. It has to hit the egress. Uh, all the all the spaces on the perimeter are going to be offices, you know. So you can get maybe 50% there with just those assumptions. We take really crazy buildings. Yeah. So like, you know, the, the rectangle the rectangle logic just doesn't apply to half mm -hmm. of what we work with. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, kind of taking a step back and and trying to analyze just our smaller programs first. I know has been fruitful, but uh, yeah, we're looking to pipe a, a CAD file or whatever through some system and understand, you know, should we take this building or not? And we're the definitely- layer of complexity sort of that we're dealing with is like, if we were is a standard sort of static product, it'd be a lot easier because we're dealing with the same standards every time. But not only is we were kind of a shipping standard, but all the other business lines are also constantly shifting and we're trying to cram them all into one building. So you can imagine like, you know, some business lines are just starting off, some business lines are more mature, sort of doing that calculation through an entire building is kind of a huge ask. And we're just kind of like scratching the surface of kind of what kind of these sort of like multi-business line calculations would be like. Yeah. Yeah, we've, we've gone very far away from handing someone a super clean schedule and saying like, here's what's in the building, because it's not gonna work. <laughs> By the time you hand them the schedule, what they're expecting to see is different. And so what we've tried to sort of do is, um, give people live views into the data stream just so that they can say um, you know hey this looks weird or this looks good instead of kind of getting this really clean you know pdf that like looks clean but you're not sure if the data that you're seeing is is right yeah so um, 
Yeah. No, you can. Um, you showed an example of where you set the JSON into a live VM for people. Oh, yeah. um, how is that being changed? So I worked on this basically this week, <laughs> so it's not. Um, but uh, oh, yeah, we'll oh, the, the JSON thing, but we'll show oh, this too. Um, just go to the PowerPoint. Should be that guy, yeah. The three D one, yeah, that one, yeah. So yeah, uh, it hasn't been really used yet. I think the idea here is that, um, you know, kind of like I mentioned, most of our our users with this data don't know about Revit, and uh, everyone knows about the web. So we've kind of been looking to, um, you know, whether it's going to turn into sort of an app where um, you can sort of you know, move in a piece of furniture when you arrive on site and check that what arrived is what was in the model. Like that could be a use case for this. Um, I know we're interested in just sort of um, democratizing content creation and allowing content to come from any platform. So if I want to build something in Grasshopper, he should be able to go into Revit and you should be able to do it in SketchUp. And we just can keep both all contribute the same thing and everyone pull down the same thing. Um, Actually for this, like when the major points like it was a few months ago like the front end team uh, from Singapore they sort of expressed a need to uh, pull content so they can display three floor plans and those guys like don't use Revit they don't know anything about BIM so like this at least for us will start creating kind of this library online where they can hit the API find a chair and sort of have all those sourcing metadata and all that stuff with it yeah so they can build more robust tools on their side but have it come from a source of truth yeah yeah, a lot of our realizations the past couple months, you know, we're hiring amazing talent, but if you can't build on something that's reliable, you know, all they can do is show us boxes that represent rooms uh, because we don't have the sort of content library that's agnostic enough for them to, you know, display a floor plan on the web. Um, but yes, this one is needs a vision. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll pull up a uh, link real quickly. This is just that web app. Um, some cool features about this that weren't in the GIF. So um, we're, there's, a, there's a PyRevit tool that harvests the model and essentially puts it on a, a Firebase, uh, and, and we're displaying it here. So I can, I can browse projects. You know, there's been 50 plus projects um, harvested to this uh, database. Um, this particular one has, let's see. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll just use this guy. So this particular one has uh, five versions uploaded. So one thing that's nice is I can kind of bounce between these. So this was the CD set three months ago. Uh, I could go back to a uh, different harvest or maybe the first one. So this is way back when we weren't even harvesting the existing conditions model. Um, as a user, I can kind of come in here and just kind of ask what I what I want. So maybe I'm searching for meeting spaces. Um, so I'm immediately going to get, you know, there's 43 meeting spaces in the project. Um, within the meeting spaces that are highlighted, you know, here's the area. Uh, with rooms, we're also harvesting objects, so I can just turn on this little toggle and get a representation of sort of where everything is, um, and this is searchable as well. What are the uh, Anything that's not a room, everything else, so lights, you know, uh, HVAC objects, anything. So this is missing that kind of second part. It's like yeah. If we had the objects to put into this, you can then display it across the board. Um, you know, similarly, this is kind of shown, but we can display things like transparency or squareness ratio. Um, these types of values are, are sort of calculated during the harvest time. So when I harvest a room, I'm also asking the room, you know, hey, what walls, what walls define you? And from those wall types, calculating a certain transparency. 
smarter ways to do it, but that's what we're doing with that. Um, the most frequent thing being at the top. So as a logistics lead, I maybe don't need all the data, I just need you know what's gonna get me most of the way there. In this case, the, the sort of eight office desks in this room. Um, among the five versions, I can click any two and sort of see a change plan. So the rooms in green have been added. Uh, the darker red rooms have more changes to them. And then if I were to hover over any room, I'm going to sort of see the changes on the left. So, you know, there was uh, there was an obstacle added to the room, uh, you know, the desk count has gone up to things like that. And cycle through the changes of the different versions. Can I talk a little bit about your supply chain getting going from models to stuff built in place? Yeah, we need help. <laughs> <laughs> uh, questions about supply chain uh, management in general. Um, usually, our sort of uh, we have procurement, we have supply chain, we have you know logistics and operations leads that kind of manage this on the ground. Um, it's also tied into the content issue. You know, the, the object in Revit should be linked to a real life thing, which should be procured and tracked. Pretty sure none of that's happening across the board. Um, so it's it's definitely a very piecemeal system right now. I know. That's kind of the inspiration for the object library project is just try to get on top of this thing. Um, I don't know. I don't know if you can speak more to that. I, mean, I think this is like where it's like really trying to sign these thing, two things together and we can only trust maybe like, I don't know, 50%, 60% of it. But if we sort of build out this content library, more of a source of truth that we can then sort of help these other departments link to it, then we get a much kind of greater, uh, I guess, uh, sense of accuracy as we sort of transfer data up and down the line. Are you at the point where, I don't know, take like a interior glazed partition wall, where you can have manufacturers, vendors um, bid on the materials and, and, and installation. Uh, so sort of like a, how Walmart does reverse auction, reverse bids in, in uh, China, and all the vendors are coming in and, and basically putting on their, their Uh, colleagues uh, sort of build uh, this whole automation that generates um, all the storefront for you, does the cut sheets, and that gets sent directly to our manufacturers. Not, I guess, so far as like uh, doing open bid, but in terms of the data model, it's um, basically straight to layout once we finish. But at that point, they're they're supplying you with quantity uh, prices, but uh, uh, currently, I believe so. Um, it might be different uh, regionally, but I think because the company is so large, and we're not exactly sort of sure exactly what's going on in yeah. that area. Okay. Yeah, we're yeah we're sort of very confident in like the material takeoffs we can give, but. The, the sort of process after that, you know, there's there's so much in the sort of deal with with 
uh, someone sort of coming on board for something of this scale that it, it gets super lost. The designs and build outs are for tenants that you have? So yes, yeah, sometimes, so a typical WeWork, which I believe is what this one was, um, you know, we kind of uh, do some market analysis, have a general understanding of a Out and it just it's it's a more sort of client service model. Yeah. So it's more typically for several rooms that you'll do this. Um, in terms of the automation takeoffs, or in terms and the folks who are going to be using. I see. Um, I don't know. I think it's pretty agnostic to. Yeah, we get a little bit of everything. To be honest, um, when we like maybe four or five. I've seen instances where there's like 10 designs going to one building simultaneously until like maybe two weeks before until it's just like either people sign or like things are settled and walls are put in. Yeah, we'll, so, we'll take out walls halfway through because a different program or tenant has come in. And it's, yeah. What's the typical lead time? Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Typical lead time? Yeah. For storefront? Yeah, sure. Zero? Negative lead time? Do you want some? <laughs> uh, yeah, I would say, I would say questions about lead time and I guess just procurement in general. Um, I think furniture and, and you know, uh, the, the more sort of interior fit out objects are what we have the toughest time getting on top of just because they're constantly changing, um, you know, manufacturers go in and out of business around those items a lot too, so it's hard to trust that a resource that's there is still active. Um, for the larger things like, you know, pretty much anything to do with an office program, we've nailed because it's 60% roughly of our, of our makeup, so it's just an obvious, obvious thing to tackle. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the sort of economy of scale applies to deciding what tools to build as well. It's like you just go after the things with the highest impact. In terms of total, I guess, lead time from possession to open, I think the shortest we've gone is like three months, and then until like maybe six. Yeah. Yeah, a fast-tracked project will sneak in under three months from when we can start building to open. Yeah. Yeah. It's wild. When you're, when you're tearing down and building new um, are you reusing or is it just trash and spraying, spraying the new materials? So we will basically um, get the designer involved as soon as possible. Um, so they'll try to walk the space and uh, this kind of happens during programming. Um, you know, we'll do due diligence and send a team out there. They'll try to identify, you know, a handful of architectural features. No, not, not original. Like when you uh, say halfway through construction or when your modules, mm -hmm. right? Because your your office modules are the same type of curtain wall every damn day, right? Mm -hmm. You still must have like a gazillion square acres of that. Mm -hmm. um, when you're tearing out the floor and building a floor across the, across town, um, are you reusing anything of your own? Trash that you're creating. Yeah, I mean, I would almost, I would almost say we're not tearing out yet. <laughs> well, I mean, it depends on like what. You're adapting the focus, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. That's part of what you do. Right. It depends on how much change there is. Um, sometimes when we're combining two offices, if there's enough adjacency, we'll maybe say like knock out the knee walls and then keep uh, the frame and just maybe take out some pieces, or maybe we'll just take out the middle so people can still sit face to face, have that open communication. Um, so it kind of just depends. Uh, part of this is also kind of a shipping product. Like before sort of we were in terms of sales was more unitized. It's kind of like you just have a six person, you sell it. But now with enterprise and larger offices, it's more of a negotiation. So it's like, hey, can I combine 
three of these offices, can I take this whole quarter of the floor? So kind of it's much more case by case basis how we deploy and strategize the changes. Yeah, we have an upgrades team that is tasked with that whole question. Okay. And they're about three people strong. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is definitely something from from our sort of architectural mindset. You know, everything from like suction cup walls, you know, is even sort of in the in the realm of possibility with with the type of um, just speed of change that we deal with. I mean, you almost don't want to glue anything together. It's crazy. Um, and yeah, like you know, various construction techniques will even sort of come into light just because they're faster, and you know, it might not be sort of the typical way to do it but it, it just works for us and you know everything from like just timing you know sometimes we'll need the floor leveled sometimes not and just the the way the sort of building is delivered to us extremely dictates the type of schedule that we're comfortable with attacking um, across the board so I've seen it all pretty much in terms of that Um, the general sort of IT infrastructure and how you roll out your plugins to all of these end users across the globe, and like, how do you how do you make sure that they have a, like the most up to date version of the plugin installed and that they're getting the updates and all of that? So the question is about uh, how we deploy our tools yeah. and how we make sure everyone has the right version. So that is a huge problem okay. that we are currently wrangling with. Um, we don't, I, I think this is also part of where it's sort of like been kind of falls short is there's no sort of standard that we have with deploying tools. There's no kind of like best practice. So what we're doing now is looking at sort of um, examples from the software engineering world, like continuous integration, kind of like uh, deployment, hosting, uh, sort of like desktop clients that could pull updates. So we're looking at all of those things to sort of set up our own kind of uh, tools deployment system that mm -hmm. can do all that. So. Yeah, we've run into sort of a snowball problem of that where, you know, when we first joined, you know, there's a thing called the app manager that it, it did that basically. But we ran into the issue where, you know, two people might be working on two separate tools that when they're just put on the same computer, both don't work because they're using, you know, referencing similar files or whatever. So there's there's much sort of larger things to tackle, but yes, the the software engineering world has has sort of done this in in spades. Um, it's amazing the workflows that exist out there um, for collaborative you know just collaborative projects all the way from you know learning from someone else's work to seeing change log and all that stuff. Yeah. I mean the two of us just like experiences this week like we just slammed kind of like two kind of code bases that we've been working separately into one and just start switching them together and it was a lot more seamless than we thought. So we like are describing the surface of kind of what we can accomplish with sort of this new knowledge as we learn more. So I mean you us back in a year we'll tell you something totally different. Yeah. I guess to tag on to that, what happens when there's a Revit upgrade? Like how do you handle Yeah, so we'll I know when we, we like skipped um, 2015, 16. Yeah. So we went we went fifteen to seventeen. Um, I would say now uh, we're fairly like automatically ready for the next versions. Like most of the tools are agnostic enough. Um, there might be some API calls that change between versions that we'll catch, but um, it's incredibly obvious when those break. Um, and we even have, I'll even show this. Oh no. I'll plug back in. I bet it's charged. Maybe not. So yeah, actually, one of our um, one of our colleagues has built. Uh, Revit API docs. So as Revit sort of releases new versions, um, you know, this is a site that will sort of automatically capture those API changes and let us know about it. So sort of trying to uh, keep up with the ever changing software problem. We're even building tools to manage that problem. Yeah, this is this is public. Yeah, uh, Revit Python wrapper and PyRevit are both open source as well. Um, so highly encouraged.
Yeah, Revit. Yeah, it's awesome. even code samples actually on Revit API docs because the same color is the Revit. Also, good. Yeah, it's so here's here's code samples. Uh, some of them are from us. Some are not. Um, just to give you an insight. Let's see. Yeah, so fairly quick tool. You know, this is I don't know, 20 lines of Python, um, and you know, creates a drafting view. Super simple. This is kind of how we started. We just took a, a Revit task we were very familiar with and tried to automate it. Um, and once you kind of get a taste of the API and some of the calls that you need to make to do certain things, it just kind of snowballs. Um, and I know for us, being super comfortable in Revit helped us learn to code 10 times faster than we would have if it was just some project uh, that someone made up. Just because I kind of knew what the end goal was, I knew the frustration involved with trying to center a room tag. Um, and it's actually like three lines of code. So it's way, way better to learn it that way than the other way. Um, but yeah, this is open source. Um, Revit Python wrapper, which is sort of the uh, Pythonic way to make Revit API calls, is also open source. Um, and actually ships with PyRevit. So if you install PyRevit, I believe this wrapper just comes with it now. So you can literally just say rpw dot and then uh, any sort of functionality that it brings. Um, just try to find an example of the... Uh, to RPW? Yeah. I don't think there is one. No, you're just talking about... Yeah. Well, yeah. Someone that works there wrote it, but separate of being at WeWork, yeah. Um, yeah, here we go. This is a good example. So, you know, if I call... Um, rpw.db.getfamilies, I'll get, you know, the families in the view. Um, that's probably like 40 lines of code. If you were to make standard Revit API calls with a Python wrapper like this, it's one. So where I might write a tool that's 20 lines of code, you know, if I was just starting out with zero resources, that's like a 300 line code program versus, you know, something I could build in half a day. So it's a huge, huge impact for sure. This is something where we sort of learn more and more as we kind of like learn more sort of frameworks and different modules and different tools. It's like people have anything you can imagine that's a problem, someone has solved it with a piece of code. So yeah. like a lot of stuff you see us build are super fast, like timelines, probably no more than like two weeks. But we're building upon a lot of work that other people have already done. So we're just kind of bringing the domain knowledge into kind of this tool building process. Do you, do you track usage and implementation from at, at the end user side, at your designer side, how much they are, are actually using your tool? Uh, yeah, so we're logging actually all of that. I don't know if we have access to that though. He's keeping track of it somewhere. Yeah, we're watching everything. Yeah, we're watching everything. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. We had, we had found someone safety here last week and they obviously oh, last month, and they obviously have a lot of their own custom tools and they literally track every single click in their customer, uh, you know, they know exactly who uh, is uh, using which tool, how much. Uh, yeah, data studio. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. well, you want the other side, right? Yeah. The, the people who are, who are not implementing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're tracking usage. Um, I don't actually have it accessible, but uh, with the auto offices tool, we were tracking sort of the output of that. And what was really interesting to see is that you actually get insight in the business in terms of what type of offices uh, fit the most in our spaces. So, you know, as 100 designers are working across the globe, obviously that information is just not being captured on a typical workflow. Uh, but by kind of building the automation beforehand and then capturing the output, you're able to gain insights that just are non-existent in, in most uh, sort of patterns. And another part of this is like, because sort of we're just learning, and like the two of us like took a stats class like a few months ago, and taking like a stats class, like everything I ever thought about data is wrong. So in terms of like usage and like things like that, just making sure we're collecting the right data in the right way, and then making the right summaries from it is still such a like a learning gap that we have to close before I think we feel confident to make assumptions yeah. based on that data. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm super scared to ever filter data right now. I'm only interested in sort of. <laughs> Pushing it forward. <laughs> How are you keeping all of your users up to date and 
<laughs> yeah, uh, it's a challenge. Yeah, so just the question on kind of training, um, exposure to what we build and how it's used. Um, let's see. Point, I guess to talk about how many more bins we have in the company than the average company. Yeah. Like, Tyson, how many bins are we at now? So we have like 50 bins like worldwide. Um, there's sort of regional training, and then there's like hotline bin that's sort of more centralized. You can ask questions on a platform, but there's like small pieces of training happening everywhere. The, the role of, of you know somebody on the bin team at WeWork is a little bit different than maybe a traditional firm where it's not in the models clicking, doing production as work. It's more support for the teams in the other disciplines. Yeah, I think like a huge thing for us in that regard is like we there's it's not physically possible to make a PDF that's going to answer someone's question in two weeks, just not. And so we're trying to develop just like resources and processes around finding information in general because you know what it is is going to change all the time. Um, so you know Hotline BIM, uh, the Connect page, the sort of democratized wiki, uh, you know are, are in place solutions. But uh, yeah, you're always going to get someone asking, you know, how do I install the printer? And then we just say, ask Hotline how to install the printer. Uh, Sweet baby Jeeps, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so really like just annoying tasks. I don't know if you guys saw this one as a, uh, I guess, former uh, architecture person, equal, equal, equal on the Revit dims, made me want to kill myself. And this is just, you know, a button away from kind of uh, automating spatial layout on a really micro scale of, of stools in this case. Um, let's see, tagging rooms. Making views, actually, this one's cool. You select rooms and it'll just make plans for you, zoomed in plans, and put them on sheets if you want, which is nice. Oh, yeah, copy paste viewport. Copy viewport on one sheet, apply to all sheets. Pretty awesome. But yeah, we have a couple different resources for, for knowledge sharing, but it's it's pretty crazy. Anyone else? Cool. Yeah. Yeah. A uh, question just about content management and uh, with so much data, how do you <laughs> trust what you're seeing? Um, so our attitude about this has changed dramatically in the last two years. But when we joined, the philosophy was, you know, we crank out WeWorks. It's super modular. Let's just data validate everything before you press save even. So if I did something wrong um, or, you know, against standards, I couldn't, I couldn't like push that work to the next stage. So that was the philosophy. I'll always catch it. You know, I'll, I'll compare it to a library. If it's on a library, it's not going. Then we got really ambitious on different business lines and different, you know, just ideas um, and keeping up with sort of how the business was evolving with that perspective murdered us. Like we could not keep up with anything. 
And so our philosophy now is to kind of let the bad data happen. Um, it's probably going to brute force happen even if you put controls around it. So we kind of let it let it take its course and then um, come up with ways to sort of automatically identify that. And it might not reconcile the, the problem, but it will uh, alert us or sort of expose that it's there. Um, and that's something that you don't see if you were to you know use Revit to schedule lights. Uh, if that light is missing, the filter is just going to miss it, and you're going to your count's going to be wrong. Like that's that's the lifespan of that error, you know, where we kind of want that error to go all the way to the the end and have someone catch it there. So, but yeah, it's a it's it's our biggest problem is is just trusting the numbers you're seeing, basically. Yeah. The tooth model also have the manufacturer details and all the warranty details that you can leverage for the next year. Yeah, the question's about just uh, uh, it's kind of linking our content with uh, external data, like uh, manufactured uh, resources. I know in our sort of version one of our content library, it was, it was fairly typical. You'd have families that have, you know, the URL link to the manufacturer site or have all the sort of cut sheets. Um, I think that's still something we're kind of going to maintain. It's just probably going to be outside of Revit. Um, yeah, but, yeah. This, this is like the two questions are very closely interlinked, and it's part of like what we're actually working on right now um, is kind of understanding that. Um, also, what we have to deal with is sort of like a global standard where a chair can mean two different things in two different regions. So you kind of have these cascading kind of levels of detail where once you get to the end, you sort of know all of the metadata. But at an SD phase, maybe here, if someone in New York is designing for like Asia without the knowledge of the regional content, that they should still be able to place the objects in and then have them override once the model gets over there. So there's like various different use cases that we have to deal with in terms of uh, making sure our metadata and our Revit content are vertically integrated throughout the company. How much of that data then gets transferred into an operation Also working on that. Okay. Um, so the question was about how much of that data gets transferred into uh, facilities management and kind of downstream. Um, so I think right now between us and facilities and operations, there's like four layers that we have to sort of like bin through to get there. Um, so we're kind of making sure that our scope is really clear and then expand out from there. Death count makes it, the death count parameter makes it all the way through. <laughs> That's about it. Maybe the area. Maybe, maybe. But yeah, small things, right? Like uh, the product team needs to know if a room is sold when they're about to go into the Revit model and delete it or change it for some reason. And like the, these types of two way, it's not even just getting the data to these systems, but actually getting their data back and informing the decisions we're making in like Revit, you know, uh, the turnaround time is like, it needs to be seconds um, because we'll, you know, email change with 50 messages just because they sold something that we then deleted in some digital model. And like, that can't happen if you want to sort of provide a, a good client facing service. You know, we're constantly kind of trying to avoid pulling the rug out from people even though we're pulling it out of our own feet like it's it's tough yeah, we'd like to i guess say that we can do all of that but it is an enormously complex problem and sort of we are hacking at it piece by piece and that sort of goes back to kind of these small integrations and how they have this network effect at scale um kind of our philosophy is that if we build these small connections and small integrations that eventually we'll get to a network effect where you could say get something from yeah. sourcing that goes all the way down to facilities. Yeah. Um, during construction, how often do you guys um, think it about from the field like going into the field inspector with the report? How often do you take that data and like the model to try and solve it? Um yeah. Yeah, the question is about uh, just uh, taking the data on site and getting it kind of into our process. We laser scan everything. Um, uh, if you know a building's coming online, we're going to send a team out there to scan it. I used to not even build EC models before I had a point cloud scan. So 
if you were to do that, the, the sort of BIM lead or architect would reconcile the scan with the EC model and make sure those match. Um, and then I think, yeah, we're, we're, we're exploring kind of, uh, you know, serial scanning. So like every, every week or every two weeks, uh, either if it's like a photo walkthrough or an actual point cloud scan. Um, and we're, we've got our sights set on sort of, you know, running the diff between what's on the construction side and what's in our understanding of the model. Um, and there's a bunch of, bunch of uh, cool technology out there, you know, placing cameras in rooms and able to sort of, you know, tell when an object leaves the space or not. All things that we're like super, super interested in. Um, but for us, the sort of existing conditions, capturing the site data and making sure the desk count that I'm promising is feasible is like the whole name of the game. Um, you know, the more confident we are with that, the earlier, the more, you know, everything else just kind of falls into place. So. Yeah, we're trying to like, make them like a really good role player because there are a ton of people who are like super smart in the company that don't know anything about BIM, that don't really care about buildings. But when the guy working on the sensor needs to know where on the floor plate that sensor is, like we need to provide something where it's sort of location based, they can see it instead of just a number they're attaching something to and having to find on the floor. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Beers. Beers. Thanks, right. guys. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys.